Um, can you uh, see the screen all right? Yes. Oh, OK. Sounds good. All right. So uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, nice uh, cold evening in January. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, hot stuff here, as in chips hot. And uh, feel free to, uh, you know, raise your hand, ask a question, or, uh, you know, get our attention. I'd be happy to answer uh, any question. Uh, I do have an awful lot of material, so uh, uh, don't worry. I won't go through it uh, uh, fast at all. I'll uh, certainly take my time. So let's see, what do we have? Oh, yes. Um, uh, th th there's a, a lot of activity going on in the semiconductor world. And uh, don't be surprised uh, to hear a lot more about them in the coming months. There's certainly, uh, uh, all of them are active. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, quite a few of them. I'll probably lead off with the Power 10 uh, chip, then uh, uh, the RISC-V. And then uh, my specialty, the ARM uh, 64FX. And then uh, a little bit about the Apple M1. And as if that is not enough, there's a whole bunch of chips out there that uh, all purport to be uh, stuff that will do or help people with uh, deep learning, machine learning, all those uh, AI terms out there. Uh, I won't say a whole lot of, uh, about them, but I will uh, give you a little uh, glimpse as to, uh, you know, uh, where people are uh, throwing their money at uh, in developing these chips. And then um, uh, try to wrap it up uh, real quick and then have a uh, little uh, discussion. So let us um, launch into the first one. Now, um, I, I've been a, a long time user of uh, the IBM uh, power architecture, uh, first with their AIX stuff, AIX stuff, and uh, re later Red Hat Linux uh, as well. And um, even back in those days, 10, 12 years ago, uh, when I, maybe it was a little less than that, eight years ago was the last time I used it, people kept telling me, uh, why do I still persist using them? And uh, I said, because uh, they have good technology. It's a very different matter if uh, people choose something else. But uh, despite uh, all those dire warnings uh, about it going away, it has not. In fact, it's actually done pretty well for itself. So um, the last time I worked with them was in their Power 6 uh, architecture that was around um, 2011 timeframe. So in the nine years uh, since, they've actually come up with the Power 7, the Power 8, and Power 9. So I thought I'd present this. These are the actual silicon dye chips. As you can see, they started off with 45 nanometer, 22, 14. And uh, what I will be uh, talking about today is the Power 10 which has uh, been fabricated at seven nanometers. And uh, it's uh, uh, quite, uh, quite an impressive uh, chip. Um, these are some of the highlights of that. And they also uh, shared that, you know, even though the Power 10 family is coming out this year, you can actually buy products based on that. They're already working on the Power 11 family. So uh, they're pretty serious about it and they continue to astound us with you know their uh, capability of uh, spinning up uh, silicon out there so let me get more into the nitty gritty hardware tech technology details i have always been interested in that and uh, I, I guess uh, early when i got started uh, way back uh, in the uh, unix world um I was always into compilers and then in code generation to see what was the instruction set, how it would work out. And pretty soon I got into risk chips as well. And that's really a compiler's dream. Your power family is actually a risk architecture chip. And so uh, for compiler writers, it's uh, a breeze within a couple of months, they can have uh, optimized code being generated. It takes now far longer to spin silicon, but far uh, 
uh, far less time to uh, have a compiler ready. It used to be the other way around 30, 40 years ago. It would take a lot of time, but uh, they've gotten real smart about it. And the compiler writers have actually given a lot of feedback, which is why we have now uh, pretty powerful chips that are going on. So here's a quick summary of the Power 10 architecture. The first thing I'd like to say, it's uh, quite astounding. It's at seven nanometers. That's the width between the lines on the silicon die which are carrying signals. And that's pretty astounding. Why do I mention seven nanometers? I don't know if you heard about it, but six, seven months ago, Intel delayed their next uh, generation of uh, processor chips because they could not reliably get their seven nanometer uh, uh, working. And so they announced a, a year's delay. So we'll see it sometime in the middle of this year uh, and their latest generation. Whereas a lot of other folks, and one more I'll mention, has gotten way ahead of Intel. So Intel has got a, a big fight on their hands. This particular one, if you take a look at the right, you'll notice an awful lot of cores and awful lot of memory and awful lot of interconnect uh, that they've been able to cram into uh, that piece of silicon. Um, it has actually 18 layers of uh, metallic uh, uh, substrate on which they've done the chip etching. And that's uh, quite a feat. If you count it up, uh, all the gates and uh, uh, circuitry out there, they add up to about 18 billion transistors. And that's uh, quite a bit. Uh, you might recall about two years ago, I gave a talk on the laws of computing and Moore's law and transistors. And so uh, two years ago, we weren't sure how things would pan out. Now we have our answer. They're still continuing to put in a lot of dense stuff. And what's more interesting is even though the a transistor count has gone up, what is more interesting to me is all the stuff they've been able to do with all that transistor and circuitry to add features. For example, this particular chip um, has a circuitry in it to assist in a quicker encryption and decryption. Um, and uh, for uh, doing a lot of, uh, you know, these big data searches and machine learning, they've added features in there uh, so that your normal integer arithmetic, they can do uh, very small fractions of that and, and that actually works quite well for AI stuff. They've not neglected uh, all the scientific and technical people. They've actually added uh, circuitry in there that will assist in matrix multiply. We love to invert matrices and solve, you know, uh, literally billions of, uh, uh, you know, uh, partial differential equations which need matrix multiply. And they've actually put in a gigantic... Um, level three cache out there, which is actually split in two parts, 64 and one part of the chip, 64 and the other part of the chip. They use uh, 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 some of that for um, sharing and then the other 128 can be actually divvied up uh, in any way you like. They've uh, got uh, firmware and software to uh, do that. And then uh, what's also interesting, and maybe I'll highlight that uh, a little bit, is they've got uh, a, a very interesting uh, circuitry out there so that you can attach any kind of memory that you want to the system. And they've got it on both sides of the chip. And uh, you'll see the advantage of that. And of course, the other thing is uh, a proprietary interconnect called Power Exxon. But that allows us to have uh, a PCI Gen 5, which is the input-output capability. Um, until uh, recently, Gen 3 and Gen 4 were the latest. But now Gen 5 has become available, and it's got astounding speeds. Uh, clearly, when they promise so much uh, performance, they need to move the data between the chips, and PCI e Gen 5 is the way. And they're continuing to uh, improve upon that. Now, PCI Gen 5 is not an IBM invention. It's actually a consortium. But the fact that they're able to uh, uh, provide that and they can easily put in the circuitry on the chip so that they can do 
hardware is uh, quite remarkable. Now, these two points, the uh, power exon and the memory interface, let's take a little uh, look at the instruction set. It's a RISC machine, and up to this point, most RISC, uh, RISC machines, uh, the characteristic of a RISC machine were that all the instructions were of the same size. In other words, four bytes long, 32 bits. And in those 32 bits, uh, you could arrange it any way that you want for operation code, execution, addressing mode. They've gone and extended it and made it eight bytes, which gives them enormous capability. And uh, uh, by making all the instructions the same width, it helps in pipelining and decoding so that actually things work much faster. In the older generation, uh, uh, things like what we call CISC, or complex instruction set. Instructions were one byte uh, uh, wide, or two byte, or three bytes, or four bytes. And so if you used uh, different instructions, first of all, it was always a compiler's, writer's nightmare. And then when it encountered different instruction lengths, it would have to discard the pipeline and start all over again. So it led to a lot of inefficiencies and a lower percentage utilization of the CPU cores. But by going to risk, everything was far more streamlined and actually worked a lot better. And so uh, they actually uh, have an open power instruction set architecture. In other words, they publish the uh, instruction set. Anyone else can go and manufacture a chip with that same instruction set and actually uh, run uh, IBM compatible software. Uh, uh, they've actually made that open source, so you can actually uh, manufacture. And there's quite a few folks who do that. The interesting thing is um, it turns out that most of those people who are making boards with open power uh, uh, instruction set, they're all located in Asia Pacific, and they're uh, uh, manufacturing and selling it out there, and some they send across to the U.S. So. That is very interesting that the open power architecture is being adopted far wide outside of the US uh, than in the US. But uh, again, they've extended it and they make this instruction set also available currently in version three. So that tells you over the last 10 years, once they move to uh, open uh, architecture instruction set, they've actually uh, uh, in increased the capability of the instruction. And it wasn't just IBM alone. They have about 100 members in open power. Many of them had a say in the instruction set. So that's pretty cool. And then, like I said, they added matrix multiply integer instructions to help with the AI stuff. And they also added a lot of things to manage the power so that they could throttle back um, the electrical load out there and therefore uh, make sure it consumed less power and do more with those instructions. And that actually gives it a performance boost. And then of course, uh, I mentioned the encryption part and then they've added also more things so that hypervisors or KVMs or other uh, things out there, uh, they can do their job a little easier and better. And that indirectly helps um, people who spin uh, virtual memory instances on it uh, rumor has it that they did that so that the Red Hat OpenShift would work a lot better. Uh, actually, anyone can use that and it'll work a lot better. But uh, the Red Hat people, after they got bought by IBM, gave them all these ideas and they were able to incorporate it into the chip. So it, it will really help uh, with that uh, Red, Hat, uh, Red Hat OpenShift strategy. So the Power 10 comes in actually two flavors. One, uh, as you see, is a, a module. A module is all the packaging around it. And then you have uh, one chip, the Power 10 chip, with all of its cores in it. And that can run at about 4 gigahertz uh, clock speed. That's uh, pretty impressive. Or you can buy a package that's slightly larger. This is, I think, approximately two scale. And you can put two such chips. Um, the, uh, the disadvantage is that you'll run at a lower clock speed, 
But uh, there are a lot of things out there that uh, would rather have a lot more cores. Uh, they're core hungry, and even at 3.5 gigahertz, it's still pretty fast. So that has an, another advantage. If you recall, on the corners of the chip, they had the memory interface and then the I.O. interface. Now that comes in handy. So this is a single chip module on the right-hand side where uh, they've got this arranged in a four by four matrix. And all of this can be packaged into whatever it is, a 4U uh, server. And they can have uh, optical connects between all of the chips out there, the green and blue wires. And effectively, all of this can act just like a single gigantic uh, uh, a processor core chip. The latency between all these chips is about uh, less than 10 nanoseconds. And they can easily um, uh, uh, put together one single uh, board with 16 sockets. And each of the sockets has about uh, you know, something like 15 cores. So they can have one gigantic uh, uh, system out there and effectively, the bandwidth to the memory, they can have it running at one terabyte uh, a second. And uh, remember the memory interface, it's pretty interesting and dynamic. You can actually put any kind of memory. You can mix up all the memory that you like, uh, DDR4, DDR5. Uh, other places, you have to have the same kind of memory for everything, either four or five. But here, you can mix them around. So it actually makes it very appealing for those people who don't need a whole lot of memory but need cores. They can actually lower the cost of the system by using DDR4, which is quite cheaper, and uh, uh, get all the performance they need by having more cores. Or if you uh, need both cores and fast memory, you can actually uh, uh, swap in uh, DDR5. You don't have to change anything in the board just uh, this, and the memory interface recognizes that, and it can work very well. And then with that uh, I/O interface, all of these can connect through that, and you can have a pretty powerful system. Here's uh, an example of where they're using the uh, uh, double uh, uh, chip uh, module, so they can still use those same interfaces, but then they'll have faster paths because they are fewer modules and have more dense interconnections. And such a system with uh, about um, four modules out there, uh, it can address two petabytes of main memory, uh, whatever combination of DDR4 or DDR5 memory you put, you can have a two petabyte main memory system uh, with uh, just uh, a bunch of cores, or you can add more cores and still have a pretty gigantic system. I think the applications are quite uh, interesting for these kind of systems where number of cores, no problem. Memory, no problem. I/O, no problem. So you can build some pretty gigantic systems with this. Uh, again, in our high performance computing world, uh, many people are looking forward to this and they're already planning to build systems. And I expect we'll hear announcements in November of this year at our annual supercomputing conference of systems using the Power Pen. So uh, uh, what about uh, applications? Uh, well, they certainly have raised a lot of expectations. Now, uh, the performance here, uh, these are um, um, estimates that are uh, handed out by IBM. And uh, I have no doubt that they'll easily meet uh, uh, these uh, performance numbers. However, we don't have an actual system available. They only have sample uh, uh, systems out there in their lab, and they're getting ready for manufacturing. So uh, until we get that in our hands, all of these are estimates. But you can see in anything that's got integer performance, you can easily expect three times the performance, just swap in uh, the old system, put in the new system. It's binary compatible. Uh, if you want floating point performance, which is what we care about, or at least I do, again, you'll get uh, easily three times the performance. And if it's a memory bound application, if you use uh, cheaper or slower DDI, uh, DDR4 memory, you'll still get twice the performance if you use the faster one. 
you'll get more than four times the performance because uh, uh, folks in, in in that large scale level, they do realize that faster cores uh, don't necessarily make a system faster. What really makes a system faster if the data that it demands from the memory can come to it uh, as fast as the CPU can consume it or spit it out, the results so that once it writes to memory, it doesn't have to wait for acknowledgement. It can move on. In other words, uh, balance. So if the memory and uh, uh, compute are balanced and they can feed each other, make sure the CPU never has to stall, you can have it uh, you know, firing on all its pistons uh, quite well. So they do care about that. And that's why you can easily get you know, uh, just four times the performance by just swapping out without uh, changing or recompiling your code or binary. But we still have to uh, wait for official benchmark. But I have no reason to believe that they won't get these numbers. They certainly uh, expect that. Um, the other numbers that they have published from their lab result uh, is the LINPAC linear algebra package. This is what we use in um, high performance computing to uh, benchmark systems. So they've actually said that once you populate it with uh, lots of cores and the right kind of memory, and the baseline is their older Power9 uh, chip, you can get a LINPAC for the same number of cores. Usually it's, uh, you know, we talk about 100,000 cores or something. They expect to get 10 times the performance of floating point on dense linear algebra. These other benchmarks, ResNet uh, uh, 50, these are um, AI applications uh, that uh, take in an image and then is able to recognize that image. So they have a standard benchmark for those. Um, if you use 32-bit floating point or 16-bit floating point or integer, in integer, it really uh, uh, can easily be 20 times faster than their uh, previous uh, platform, the Power9. Uh, on uh, image recognition and uh, pattern recognition uh, benchmarks. But either way, it's uh, quite impressive that they can get larger numbers. And most AI applications are trending towards using integer uh, uh, arithmetic because what they do is they build all these neural networks. And for each point on the, uh, the network, uh, they assign it an integer, and then they can quickly uh, iterate through that, and therefore in integer performance uh, plays a big role. And we'll see that in a couple other chips as well, that uh, they've uh, paid attention to uh, all this uh, machine learning that's going on and boosted their integer arithmetic performance here. Here's what a uh, actual system looks like. This is the way uh, the module is organized, the socket, and how it gets seated in here in the actual system. And um, then this is all the uh, packaging uh, on the system uh, motherboard. And to the right is that actual large uh, wafer scale that they use to do the lithography etching of it. And uh, it might interest you to know that uh, IBM uh, uh, no longer uh, manufactures silicon. They used to uh, until a few years ago, but this power 10 chip is actually being fabricated over in Korea um, by Samsung for them. So uh, they can turn it around and they have their seven nanometer process working. Um, there are two, two places in the world, Taiwan and Korea, that have some astounding uh, semiconductor uh, fabrication uh, facilities. And our Intel is uh, still trying to catch up they had a little trouble with theirs, but they've, they've, they've said that they've sorted it out. So we should see uh, seven nanometer chips from them uh, not too far, maybe a few months away from now. Any questions or uh, thoughts? Okay, sounds good. We'll yeah, I have a question. I have a question. Uh, yes, yes. Right. You've got billions of transistors on these on these chips. Yes. Certainly, there's got to be an error rate there. I mean, uh, uh, typically, how many of those don't work? 
Oh, so and what do they do, and what do, they do about it? If, I mean, you, you can't have uh, two and a half billion transistors on it and expect that, the, that every single one of them works or the whole chip is gone, can you? Okay, there, there are two things. One is, um, uh, th that's the reason why they're using Samsung, uh, because uh, on the wafer, there's a factor called yield, you know, and uh, good semiconductors will actually have a good process so that the yield is high. You don't have to throw away that many silicon wafers and the etching comes out right. Uh, they use uh, uh, ultra high frequency, uh, ultraviolet high frequency lithography to do the etching so that you can get the seven nanometer. Then the other thing is well before that etching of the chip starts, the circuitry that they're designed a very high proportion of those billions of transistors is dedicated to error uh, 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 error management. Uh, a lot of error correction is going on all the time while they're doing their calculation and significant amount of real estate and circuitry is dedicated to that. And uh, uh, they've already baked that in and, and this is a, a known process that they did when they started going multi-core, two-core, four-core. Uh, a lot of real estate is devoted to making sure that when those bits are transmitted on silicon, that they're uh, checked and rechecked and uh, retried and done all within uh, you know, the clock frequency of that chip. Okay, so what you're saying, it sounds like what you're saying is that they don't expect everything to work perfectly all the time and they built a, a whole system around tolerating failure and managing to, to survive. Uh, That's correct. Failure. That's correct. And as a matter of fact, when they come up with these uh, 4 gigahertz or 3.5 gigahertz figures, they've actually tested it at frequencies of 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz to see what would the effect be, how bad uh, it is, how well their circuitry can handle the error rates. And so they keep lowering it till they can uh, guarantee that every bit that's handled is recovered and uh, dealt with. So you don't have to worry about it. But that's how they do their testing. They run it at very high clock frequencies for several weeks to uh, shake them out and make sure the circuitry is working. So yes, it has been baked in. A question about instructions. We, we have risk uh, chips and sys chips. Do you have some ex uh, examples of instructions that are in the sys that would be in a sys uh, instruction set that are not in a risk chip? Uh, uh, yeah. how, many, how many instructions are there, and, and specifically, what kind of things do they throw overboard to get the efficiency? Okay. Well, uh, that itself deserves a, a complete hour by itself. Um, but uh, if you just did a simple comparison, for example, a, um, a, a memory fetch and add instruction, in a CISC, uh, the memory fetch might be, you know, uh, two bytes along the instruction. And the calculation, maybe if it's a multiply, would be uh, three bytes long. So there already you've got different instruction lens and therefore the decode, load and store will take up many clock cycles. In a risk, both your load, store and calculate, they're all of the same size. So it can fetch each of those instructions in a single clock cycle. So you saved uh, um, a, a couple of dozen clock cycles right there. And, and that extends to practically the entire instruction set. Uh, uh, many of them might be the same, but the, in the risk, they're all of the same length. Whereas in CISC, they're all of different lengths. And so you'll have uh, a, a very unstructured flow of instructions from memory to the CPU and back. And there'll be frequent stalls and uh, misses and rebuilding of the pipeline all the time. So it's kind of like saying in risk, one size fits all. Whereas in CISC, you'll have your tall, short, 
uh, broad, narrow, and uh, every time you'll have to adjust things as each different instruction set comes in. And that uh, leads to uh, a loss of total throughput. So that's the best uh, uh, analogy I can draw for you as the difference between RISC and CISC chips. So your Intel, uh, Pentium or Xeon is an example of uh, CISC, CISC. But your Spark, your ARM, they're examples of RISC chips. Thank you. Yeah. OK. All well, right. Mr. Jackson had a question. Uh, yes, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Basically, what you're saying is that this, this chip and the potentially defective <coughs> transistors are really uh, all covered by fault Fault tolerant computing, is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Fault tolerant circuitry. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Fault, fault tolerant computing, uh, what happens in that is you can use a lot of cheap hardware, but you use three copies of the same hardware. It's called TMR, triple multiple redundancy. So you actually have three machines doing the same calculation. If one of them has a fault, then the other two are relied upon to deliver the correct answer and they discard the third. That's how, uh, um, you know, you might have uh, recalled uh, computer systems like Tandem and a few others that used to do fault tolerant computing. They would build machines with uh, three copies of everything and they would always uh, uh, take uh, two out of three as the correct answer and move forward. But here, it's the circuitry which is doing all that for you. So it's, uh, you don't see it at the assembly language or uh, you know, software level. It handles it in the circuitry itself by ensuring all the bits are always correct as they move along the path. Okay, now let me move to uh, one very exciting uh, thing, which is, uh, I would say, kind of been in the stealth mode, but uh, today it is uh, uh, certainly making people sit up and take notice, and that's the Risk V platform. And this is truly an open hardware platform like open source. Allow me to elaborate. So we actually, uh, uh, it turned out very well that we had a discussion on risk because uh, I was going to repeat it here anyway, but uh, the history of risk uh, uh, goes back uh, quite a while and uh, it really stands for reduced instruction set computer. I don't particularly like it because it doesn't convey the meaning correct. What they mean by reduced instruction set is that by making all the instructions the same length, you need fewer instructions to do the job of what 400 uh, uh, um, uh, complex instruction sets are needed. Think of it this way that in a CISC machine, uh, they had 400 different uh, assembly language instructions. But in RISC, they'll only need about 100 assembly language instructions to do the job of what 400 needed to do because they were all uniform and the same size. So uh, uh, they made each instruction very capable. So you didn't need uh, that. And because of that, the architecture is far more streamlined. Now, some of the earliest uh, risk machines uh, uh, appeared at the time I was in graduate school from the University of California, Berkeley and Stanford MIPS. And uh, uh, clearly, they were a success because the Berkeley Risk Machine became the spark. And uh, you all know about the history of Sun Microsystems. And at the same time, Stanford also designed a risk machine called MIPS. Um, and the MIPS uh, uh, chip uh, was adopted by Silicon Graphics and many others. And they used that as their main processor. And of course, they weren't the only ones. Uh, Hewlett Packard, they created their own risk design called PA Risk. 
some of you who had Hewlett Packard, uh, you know, systems at your shops uh, would certainly remember PA risk machines. Compaq uh, came out with their own called the Alpha, which was, uh, uh, you know, held its uh, while. But then once HP bought Compaq, they kind of made Alpha disappear and put everything on PA risk. Now they still sell PA risk, but not in the same numbers anymore. But the two uh, uh, very popular ones uh, are ARM, which you all know uh, uh, runs uh, tons of uh, mobile phones all over the world. They, they use the ARM chip. Interestingly, uh, many of you may not know, this is a little bit of trivia, ARM actually stands for the ACORN, as in that acorn which falls from a tree, risk machine. And this was a British design. And even to this day, they design uh, machines or uh, instruction sets, but they don't actually make the chips themselves. You can go and get an ARM design for them, from them. And then you can go to any uh, fab in the world, Global Foundry, uh, Texas Instruments, National Semiconductor, uh, all the uh, Japanese, the Hitachis, the Fujitsus, uh, uh, or uh, Samsung, or anyone, and say, uh, uh, take this arm and uh, make me these chips and do it for you. So ARM is really a uh, chip uh, design licensing company. Everyone else uh, uh, fabricates the chip. In the industry, they're known as Fabless semiconductor means they don't open, uh, they don't operate a chip fabrication, but they do design semiconductors. And the other one, which is uh, quite uh, uh, popular, uh, the grandfather of the power uh, chip that I just described, or the Power PC. And you all will know that the Power PC uh, was running on Apple for quite a while till they switched over. They started off with Motorola, switched to PowerPC for several years. Then from PowerPC, they switched to Intel. And now they switched to their own M1 design that I'll talk about uh, in, in a little while. But before the Berkeley uh, RISC machine or Stanford MIPS machine, uh, they actually uh, were uh, RISC-like designs. Uh, the example is the IBM 601. Uh, it, it was a research project. It was called the 601 because that was the name of the building in which they designed and fabricated it. Cray Research itself, uh, the Cray computers, uh, in order to gain speed, they actually uh, designed their machines, which when you look at it, you'll say, but that looks like a risk design. Well, clearly, because they realized a long time ago that if you want performance, you want to uh, uh, harmonize, streamline everything. So the pipeline is fast, the memory fetching is fast, uh, uh, storing of results to memory is fast, decoding will take one clock cycle. And all of those four things are the hallmarks of a risk machine, except that Cray didn't call it that, but uh, he, he came up with the designs early on because he realized in order to do performance, you need uh, a, a risk-like, uh, uh, you know, design. So, uh, but it, it's the Berkeley uh, design and the MIPS design that are actually still very strong today. Now, why do I tell you all this history? Because what happened was that uh, the people who designed the early uh, risk machine at Berkeley, which was a graduate student uh, project, and then um, if you recall, a person by the name of Bill Joy was also from Berkeley. He took that and turned it into Spark. So uh, they basically adopted the Berkeley risk design and then made it into a commercial success. But the people, the academic people behind it, um, uh, I think I mentioned one named David Patterson. Yes. And uh, his PhD student, uh, Asanovic, they decided that, you know, uh, why don't we make our design open source? So they actually said, sure. Uh, and they gave the specifications and they created a RISC V consortium. And uh, why RISC V? Because every couple of years they improved uh, the design and they made it open source. 
And the current fifth generation of that design, uh, it's called Risk V or Risk V. Um, it's uh, available under Creative Commons. So you can actually, just like Open Power, you can go and take the design and actually manufacture boards or processors. And uh, because it's a very clean design and because it's open, several people uh, uh, suggested improvements to it, just like open source, and it got incorporated into it. And you'll see that that is one of the reasons why it has caught on in the embedded system world. You've heard of IoT, you've heard of self-driving, you've heard of all these other things. Well, they need computer chips. They're certainly not using Intel chips because, uh, first of all, they're very complex instruction set. They draw a lot of power. And when you want to put little computers in little devices or put lots of computers inside a car or something and drive itself, you can't afford to have you know, uh, hundreds of kilowatts pouring into it. It turns out that the RISC-V is a very good solution to this, whether it's a small embedded processor or you take uh, hundreds and thousands of these and build a supercomputer or take hundreds and thousands and create a cloud uh, 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 data center, you can do it with the RISC-V. So, um, the fifth generation, they actually have added a 64-bit or 128-bit. They've added uh, extensive floating point, vector instructions. And similar to the Power 10, they've added instructions for networking in I.O. And the design is actually available. It's called uh, uh, Rocket Design. You can go to the website and uh, download it. Turns out that the Europeans, um, a few years ago, uh, they found out that uh, uh, it was a real battle with Intel. They wanted to uh, not depend upon Intel. They saw what happened when China wanted to build a large machine, and the US government stopped in and told Intel, you can't sell those chips to China. Well, China went and invented its own. They took the MIPS design and created their own chip. The Europeans saw that, and they said, We'd like to go to an open source design so we don't have to depend upon Intel. And that's called the European Processor Initiative. So they've actually encouraged a, a bunch of companies who have taken that design and they're manufacturing boards for them for use in European products. If you want to know more about it, uh, uh, David Patterson, uh, the original guy behind the Berkeley Risk, he wrote a book called the Risk V Book. And uh, you can uh, uh, go buy it, download it, and it has the current uh, generation of this described. And uh, that, that's what uh, a large number of Asia Pacific, as well as storage companies, as well as embedded system companies and European companies are starting to make uh, chips uh, based on the risk five. Now, they have pretty good reason. And here's that reason. So uh, this was published, I believe, in December. Um, uh, there's a company out in Silicon Valley that uh, manufactures uh, risk v boards. And uh, they published a benchmark called CoreMark. And uh, this is based upon uh, how many instructions they could uh, do for every unit of power. And if you look at this graph, you can see it easily outclasses everybody else out there. So that is what made people sit up and take notice that uh, we have needs where we don't have a whole lot of electrical power, but we do need to do an awful lot of calculations. And they are uh, uh, adopting the risk five for embedded system computing. At least that's what I see. Um, I attended a conference in December uh, called the Risk Five. Let me just go ahead by yes, the Risk Five Summit in December, and um, uh, this was the actual funny, funny enough, the fifth time they had that conference, and they had over a uh, hundred companies there, 
and about uh, 500 people attend. The very first one that they had, the Risk Five Summit, had just like maybe three companies and about 50 people. And what you see there is a picture of the actual Risk Five machine. It's right there in the center of the core, and all of these are the pins surrounding it. And then this is the ceramic packaging uh, or to go in a socket. So that's what it looks like. It's an actual uh, real chip. And so uh, there are a couple other benchmarks, but this is the one that is publicly available. As you can see, it is uh, quite impressive. Um, uh, the Risk Five uh, machine that at three gigahertz, they could get an awful lot of performance out of it. And um, so that rocket design, uh, plus a few other derivatives, um, are actually available. And uh, uh, guess what is the operating system running on it? Linux, because uh, one of the community members, the RISC-V community members, did the port. And there's actually RISC-V hardware support in the Linux kernel uh, from Linux 4.15 onwards. They've already got all the uh, tools out there. They've ported BSD, uh, uh, GCC, glibc. Uh, Clang, uh, a real-time operating system, and emulation software. They're all available on that hardware platform. So there's a, uh, a growing and thriving ecosystem for the RISC-V chip. And there's a lot of other projects going on. I thought I'd list some of that. The kernel debugger, uh, the K-probes, uh, the extended Berkeley packet filter, which uh, and take incoming packets, and you can use that for testing device drivers and stuff like that, and uh, all sorts of uh, stuff. And this is just a small uh, list, um, uh, but it's uh, pretty active, and they're porting tons of stuff. And um, uh, there's even more hardware support. Uh, I won't read through all of this, but this last one is quite uh, interesting. Uh, Microchip is a company that actually has formed over the last 20 years by acquiring other semiconductor manufacturers or board manufacturers. And they have a RISC-V chip uh, called Polar Fire. And uh, this is the one that's being used in embedded systems uh, a great deal. <coughs> they sell um, um, very large numbers. You know, uh, We're talking millions uh, in these boards for all sorts of embedded applications. A uh, little bit more about it. So uh, what Linux distros are available? There are quite a few. I've only mentioned a few in today's talk. Fedora is one. And here's a timeline that they shared with me. They started the port way back in 2016. And uh, they actually uh, did the bootstrap loading and added uh, many things. And at this point, uh, you can have all these things. And that's a, a little picture of that uh solar uh, board out there from microchip at the bottom out there so it's running uh, quite happily and uh, uh yet yeah, you can have a complete uh, linux uh, distro running on risk 5 yeah so uh that's that's uh, a story there there's other there's a debian distro now available on risk 5 and a few others um but i think the major ones they've already got and people are uh, developing uh, entire uh, products based on that. Of course, all in the embedded system world or things like uh, network controllers, um, uh, uh, cloud computing stuff, storage. Uh, you've heard of a company called Western Digital. Well, all of their uh, current and future storage products, which are using their media, they're using the RISC-V chip so that they can uh, uh, do data uh, writes uh, 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 very quickly, uh, encryption, error correction using the RISC-V chip. So you can even uh, uh, go over to the Western Digital or uh, several of these other companies that are now using RISC-V as their hardware platform to uh, deliver products. And, um, and not, not just embedded, but even storage companies Network uh, product companies are also uh, turning to that instead of uh, Intel's or others out there. So to me, I see ARM, 
and uh, risk five as uh, being you know sold in the masses at the high end you have power 10 and of course you still have intel out there x86s but uh, clearly you know the distribution uh, of the pie is changing a little bit here okay um so that's about 50 percent uh, of uh, <clears throat> Today's, I'll pause to take a little drink of water. And uh, any questions? Because uh, I'm uh, about to tell you a little story here in high performance computing before I talk about the ARM 64FX. Yeah, so the RIF 5, uh, can you get a complete computer, like a single board computer or yes. something like a Raspberry Pi for that? Yes. Um, I, you know, I should have put a picture of all the uh, suppliers who are actually selling single board computers, but uh, let me make a note and I'll email it to you. So, um, so funnily yeah. enough, I was yeah. looking on online for Risk Five for sale, and apparently Walmart has the Cyped MI mics. I think it is one watt Risk uh, development board. Of all places. Well, um, you know what? Uh, 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 I, okay. Do you see that website, Risk V Summit? So if you like, you can go to that uh, website. Um, oh, well, it's not working right now. I'm not sure why, but uh, um, I attended the Risk Five Summit, and uh, there were about like fifty uh, uh, hardware vendors there. So um, uh, you, you can get, uh, you know, uh, single board computers for it. No doubt about it. Uh, let me see. I thought I had a picture. That th there's your single uh, board computer right there. Yeah. Do you do you see that yeah, on the lower right hand corner? Yes. Yeah, 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 so that's yeah. one example. And, and there's uh, quite a few others up there. Uh, microchip, you can go to their website. and But you'll find a lot of Asia Pacific and European manufacturers. Uh, amongst the US ones, I know Western Digital and uh, a few others uh, out there. They're all on the West Coast uh, who are doing you know a, a lot of stuff out there. But that's uh, one example uh, right there. And there's many more. I'll uh, I, I, I'll send you. I made a note to send you a list of all those uh, folks doing risk five, and expect to see more. Okay, now let me tell you about the ARM. Four. Yes. Uh, all kinds of things have processors in them. I mean, obviously we have small, you know, single board computers and stuff, but but everything that is. Uh, Internet of Things, IoT compatible, would have a processor in it. Even the disk drives have processors. Yes. I suppose yes. even a thumb drive has. Have you any idea <laughs> what the total number of processors being produced in the world today is per year or per month? And any idea what the total volume is? Well, uh, I will try my best to imitate Carl Sagan, but I can honestly say it's billions and billions. It's it's astounding. It's a lot. We're talking several billion each year of processor chips here. Yeah, going into all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff. I mean, just just uh, uh, and I, you have to include uh, all the phones, you know, the smartphones, the tablets. It's an awful lot here. Yeah. It's in the billions here. Yeah. And uh, uh, Market share, well, uh, it seems uh, uh, a lot of folks have uh, a good chunk of that share. So let me add, um, let me just put the word billion and I'll remember what it was about. But yes, it's an awful lot here. And uh, we may not see so many of them here in the United States because one of the biggest consumers is China. They are uh, gobbling up. They're making a lot, and they're gobbling a lot. So they're uh, a big part of that story. 
let me now talk about the on 64 fx and um, this is fairly uh, new but i have to tell you a story so every year uh, we uh, find out who has the biggest baddest most powerful supercomputer in the world and for that what they have to do they have to run that linpack benchmark you probably saw me talk about it on slide 10 on the power 10 the linear algebra package so they have to run it and a, 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 that, uh, uh, the benchmark runs itself. You just uh, uh, load it, compile it, and then it has a script which figures out how many processors you got, how much memory you got, and then comes up with the largest equation for it to solve. And then when it solves that, then it says it took so much time, and this is the fastest speed it achieved during that time, and that is the LINPAC benchmark for supercomputers. And it's reported on a website called top500.org. 25 years ago, when they came up with that benchmark, they never anticipated more than 500 systems in the world would ever you know, be in that list. Of course, now there are much more than that, but uh, only those who report the benchmark. Um, as a matter of fact, that benchmark automatically emails a copy of the result to a central location. So you don't have to do anything except download it and running. And uh, this particular machine uh, called the Fugaku, and I'll tell you uh, the origin behind the name, uh, is ranked number one in the world. And it's ranked by a very wide margin uh, for a while, it was the Chinese. Uh, uh, for the longest time, uh, US machines were number one. But this machine has beat both the Chinese and the US uh, by a, a, a fair margin. Uh, it actually uh, was four times faster than the fastest US machine. And of course, everyone was impressed. And it turns out that this machine was designed using an ARM processor, in, uh, and it was built by Fujitsu for a uh, research uh, center in Japan. And it, it's located in the city of Kobe, and they spent six years uh, designing this, and uh, the customer was the Riken Institute. Uh, it's known by its initials R-CCS, and uh, uh, they didn't uh, uh, design this cold. Before that, they were running uh, another supercomputer, which was uh, called the K computer. Um, and that was built using uh, several thousand Spark processors. And they learned from that experience. And they used that experience to design this one in which they use the ARM. Now, the name is called Fugaku, which is apparently the way people refer to Mount Fuji in Japanese. So when they say Fugaku, they think you're talking about Mount Fuji, but it's also the name given to this machine. And uh, not only was this machine the fastest amongst all the supercomputers, it was fast in a number of other benchmarks. The Graph uh, 500 benchmark is a benchmark that is a search benchmark. How fast can you search, you know, uh, traverse a graph in the shortest time possible? Another benchmark is the high-performance uh, conjugate gradient. It's a math benchmark. And then there is a benchmark for AI, and it even topped that list. So this is a machine designed from the ground up based upon 10 years of experience of another machine and they put in all sorts of interesting features so it can work across practically any application they threw at it. Here's a picture of that machine or part of that machine. This is an actual picture of their computer room. Uh, that, that, uh, very, uh, uh, almost like a science uh, fiction movie, gray ceilings, gray floors, gray walls and some sort of lighting and all, everything looks the same. Here's another bigger picture of the machine. If you look carefully, you can see Mount Fuji 
a slight image of it at the front of these cabinets. That's, uh, uh, and then here at the bottom, you can see Fujitsu uh, that they've got. And this is a picture of the entire machine, left, right, and uh, in a room by itself, which is earthquake proof. You can see the ventilation tiles on the left and this floor. And this is, uh, you know, of course, uh, released by that research institute, Riken. And this uh, turns in a pretty impressive performance. Here's a certificate saying that, man, you are the fastest. You're using the ARM 64FX chip, specially designed by them with Fujitsu. And um, if I remember correctly, it was uh, fabricated by uh, TSMC. You might know that acronym. Uh, TSMC stands for Ty Taiwan Semiconductor Corporation. They're, they're the, one of the best semiconductor fabs in the world. And it has 48 cores, each chip running at 2.2 gigahertz with a proprietary interconnection between all those uh, you know, uh, racks that you see out there. So it's got the number one and it can turn in 415. They've improved that number since then. Floating petaflops, uh, quadrillion, floating point operations per second. So that's why it uh, won that award. And then the HPCG, which is another mathematics uh, uh, benchmark, they're also number one. They beat out uh, several machines, including existing US machines and previous Chinese machines. And then the AI benchmark uh, that they also won. So it can work across you know, a whole bunch of applications. Now that, what you see in front of you, is the actual chip, the A64FX. While it does say Fujitsu, because uh, they went to ARM and said, this is the design we our customer wants. They did uh, uh, all the checking of the circuitry and all that. And then they picked the ARM architecture. And then with the help of TSMC, they fabricated it. And uh, I'll show you a better picture out here. But a little bit about the architecture. Clearly, it's a 64-bit, but they added vectors to it. And it's made a, also with 7 nanometers. And it's got a bus width of 512 bits. So it can, and also it can do floating point and integer arithmetic built into it. So this helps with the AI stuff. It's got 48 compute cores. And depending upon uh, the early version of the chip or newer version, four extra helper cores, what these helper cores do is they take care of the IO and memory so that the compute cores can do what they do best, calculations. It can talk to the memory uh, at one terabytes a second, and it's got uh, a 28 gigabit a second interconnect to other chips inside that cluster. Uh, so it, it's quite a capable uh, chip that it can do all of this. Now, a lot of people say it's an exascale machine, but not in the classical sense. Uh, we call exascale only if it does floating point. Uh, it doesn't uh, come anywhere close to an exascale. It's about maybe 40% uh, of an exascale, but it's certainly in the AI part, it is exascale. But what it's uh, interesting is this is an example of what has now been become the norm in the last five years, code design, where software compiler writers sit down with chip hardware design, designers and say, this is how our software works. This is what we do. This is how we do compare, fetch. You need to make your chip design and instructions match that of software so that there's a one-to-one -one mapping and only then it'll run fast as opposed to you come up with the hardware chip design and then we have to do all sorts of hoops in software so that we can run your instruction set and lose a lot of efficiency. But if you make your design match our software or the kind of operations we do, then we can have a much more streamlined approach. So that's what we call code design. And uh, in fact, 
Uh, that's what I'll talk about in the Apple chip as well. That's what's happened in the power chip. And that's what's happened in the risk chip. But this is a, a great example because of the performance. So what is cool about this? That people were saying, oh, it's a number one machine and it's not Intel, it's not IBM, it's not a Chinese machine, but it's uh, using chips that power your smartphones. Of course, a special version of that chip. And because it's using a smartphone chip, it doesn't need that much power that an Intel machine does. And the company Arm, which is in the business of design, not manufacturing, they, uh, 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 because they were working on this for the last six years, they have become interested in becoming a supplier of design. Uh, no wonder that NVIDIA bought them. Uh, does anyone remember how much in NVIDIA paid for Arm? Uh, the purchase is in final, but it's expected sometime this year. Uh, uh, you know, all the regulators will agree. They paid forty billion dollars for ARM, who doesn't manufacture chips, but they design them. And ARM itself has been supplying chip designs uh, in the high-performance computing world. So clearly, they see this as a key advantage. And they've done this at the expense of Intel. So, uh, you know, they, they've been around for maybe 30 years, but uh, certainly in this field of high performance computing, cloud computing, and general purpose computing, they, they've become a player. Now, here's a picture of the chip itself. If you look, it looks uh, strangely a lot similar to the IBM chip where you've got the cores and memory in the center, and around the edge is the connections for the I.O. and stuff like that. Now, this is not as dense as the uh, IBM chip. It's got, got about just under 9 billion transistors. Uh, but it, it's designed with uh, a lot of U.S. Uh, chip manufacturers supplying key parts of it. Fujitsu supplied some parts, uh, as well as ARM gave the instruction set and TSMC did the fabrication. Um, they used uh, what is called FinFET technology, field effect transistors to uh, make the chip circuitry. Here's a slightly better look. As you can see how they've spread the cores, L2 cache. Internally, there's a ring bus to connect all the cores together. Uh, on this side is the memory interface, and on the top and bottom, is the IO interface to connect the chips and the peripherals. And here's the memory. And here's a more simple uh, architecture. So you've got your cores, they talk to the memory, they talk to an internal ring, which talks to the PCIe and the interconnect to connect all the system boards in rows and rows of uh, the uh, racks out there. So that's what, uh, this is what the design are, Raiken gave Fujitsu, who turned it into this design, which was then manufactured by the TSMC people. Now, here's an actual board. If you notice, uh, uh, this entire thing is copper because they uh, uh, run it at a clock speed and it's so dense, 48 cores on each of the chip, and there are two chips out here that they mount it with copper and you can see these pipes running in out and they put in cold water at one side cool the entire thing and take the hot water out at the other end so this entire thing is 100 percent water cooled and that's why they can run it at so many cores 48 cores at that high clock speed you can imagine the heat it puts out and they chose the arm chip because of the lower power consumption they could have so many cores, and of course, then uh, it'll generate a lot of heat. So it's all uh, water cooled. And this is just one CPU and memory unit combined into one piece. And then they take many of these and make a uh, uh, rack. And you can see how dense these racks are stacked up. Very tall racks out there. Um, 
And each one is a node. On a node are two uh, CPUs, uh, the Fujitsu CPU. It's put in a package, and they've got about 384 nodes to a rack. Here's a slightly better picture. So there's a chip which goes onto the board, and they're two to a board, which then they package all together into a module. And then this module goes into a uh, full uh, unit. Then that full unit goes into a rack, and then that rack becomes one rack out of a cluster of all of these together. Um, so that's your uh, uh, Fugaku system using the ARM64. And it's got more than 150,000 nodes. And uh, you can do the math. Each node out there has uh, two sockets. Each socket has 48 cores. So if you compare their previous system, remember the K computer, um, they needed uh, uh, 8,000 nodes using the Spark chip. And those 8,000 nodes are replaced by 384 nodes. A single rack is equivalent to 80 racks of the previous machine. And here's the same uh, uh, system uh, that I showed uh, with the board. So putting it all into perspective. Uh, and uh, if you look at the footprint of the older machine, 128 uh, square meters, and this is one square meter, ultra dense, ultra dense machine. So uh, if you do the calculations out there, uh, this is what you get. If you run it at two gigahertz clock speed, you can get even higher performance, but they typically run it at 2.2 gigahertz. And so they can get a pretty good theoretical performance of 537 petaflops. Actual performance is about 440 petaflops, and that's what is reported. But the AI benchmark, it gets an awful lot of uh, uh, high scores, uh, much faster than anything else out there. So uh, quite a system out there with uh, several cores and at a very high clock speed. Now, this uh, particular chart was given to me by the Riken people. They wanted uh, uh, to compare one that one research system that's number one in the world. If you wanted to compare it, um, if you look at the number of smartphones uh, that are sold in Japan, about 20 million each year, that is equivalent to one of their system when you do the math uh, around that. So that's uh, uh, quite a machine equivalent to 20 million smartphones. When it comes to electrical power draw, it draws about 30 megawatts. And if you add up the draw of the smartphones uh, at 10 watts each, that's about 200 megawatts. And it's using the ARM, the smartphone, or Android, Linux, or iOS. This particular system runs Red Hat. Yes, it is actually. Uh, if you just recompile your uh, Red Hat executable for the ARM, you can run it on the system unchanged because it's a ARM chip and it's running Linux. The only difference is it has extra instructions. Well, if your code doesn't use it, no problem. If you use it, then it'll run quite fine. And the comparison with the old computer, which used Spark, they're using ARM out here uh, with Red Hat. So. Uh, that's the comparison that they wanted uh, me to share, that this is a super efficient system, and it was only possible with an ARM A64FX uh, machine. Now, going to performance, we always want to know applications. So uh, some of you may recognize these applications. Open Foam is actually a uh, CFD code out of the UK. It's open source. You can download and run it and do calculations uh, like, you know, we use it here in the automotive industry a great deal to get smooth uh, uh, exterior shapes of uh, cars. Uh, CFD, it's, it's uh, computational fluid dynamics. And this is being compared <coughs> to an X86. They did a light by light comparison. I forget which X86 it was, but it had 24 cores, so they took two sockets. 24 to compare with 48 cores. 
that was running at 2.9 gigahertz. Their machine, the AX uh, arm, was running at 2.2. You can see it's easily two to three and a half times faster across a bunch of codes. Abinid is a chemistry code. Um, this is the spec uh, uh, finite element code uh, from spec. WRF is a weather code. And I forget what MPAS is, uh, a particle scientific code. But this gray out here is the x86. And this orange is uh, the ARM uh, FX, a A64 FX. So a, a, it's very power efficient uh, compared to uh, all of these codes. Now, it's not like this is just a purple single built machine. If you want a server, you can easily go to uh, Fujitsu, and they actually have a product name called the FX700. And you can buy it, uh, I think, uh, two of these nodes uh, with everything, rack, shack, everything built in will cost you $39,000. Uh, you can buy it. And uh, they're not the only. Uh, uh, a vendor building uh, A64 FX uh, machines, Craze building systems. In fact, they've already built two systems and they've sold both of them to uh, companies in the UK and they're already planning to build more of these. So uh, uh, from you know four years ago, zero to today, the number one system and several orders in the pipeline with few of them installed already, and a commercial product, FX700, that at least I know they're selling in Asia Pacific and installing it. Um, clearly, you know, ARM is not just for smartphones. Uh, they're using it in uh, commercial servers as well. And as long as it runs Red Hat Linux, you know, folks are fine with that. Yeah. Okay, time to take uh, my last break. And then we'll go to the uh, last uh, last talk. I'll take a drink and uh, any questions. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Paul, you're on mute. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, Sharon, what happens to the old computers? Where do they go to die? Something along, something like this comes along and it obsoletes these old things. But they just well, yeah. In my world, in my world, uh, it's a mix. Sometimes the manufacturer takes it back and recycles them. Many places they actually uh, uh, break it up into smaller uh, systems and donate them to other units or entities. In large organizations, the older machine is actually reused by other departments or other locations. So uh, it's uh, mixed, uh, you know, uh, some are recycled, some are reused, some are still kept around. At the University of Texas, they've got all four of their machines that they've acquired over the last 10 years. And all of them are active and all of them are being used. So, so it's uh, mixed all over. over, at, at, over Ford, so at Ford, we have these big, big data centers that are being emptied out. And they've got yeah. these pallets covered with these systems. And they're going to a company called Great Lakes Recycling. So that's a company that basically takes them in and scavenges around and finds the parts that still work, resells those, then takes the rest and just puts them into a, a blender. Yeah, quite likely. I can only speak for supercomputers. I know what they do with that, but I don't know what they do with uh, most of the servers and stuff like that. Uh, I know many of the cloud companies, uh, they have not um, recycled. They just keep adding more and building more data centers. But I, I suspect uh, there are many small companies that pick up these systems for uh, pennies on the dollar, and then they break it up and resell it to small businesses and stuff like that. Yeah. So it, it's mixed here. Yeah. Uh, Paul, did you have a question? I, uh, you were still on mute, so I could not hear you. I think Paul is on the phone. 
Oh, okay. Because I, I saw him uh, speaking, but I could not hear him. <coughs> okay. Now let's move to the last one, uh, the Apple M1. Um, and uh, I'm told it's an Apple aficionado's delight. In, in other words, if you're uh, an Apple user, you'll be delighted uh, by it. At least that's what I'm told. I'm going to find out myself soon. Uh, we've got one on order, so soon as it shows up, you can expect me to play around with it. If I'm not mistaken, Jim has one, so we might uh, ask him uh, his experience. But I only have a just a couple of slides left, and then we will uh, hopefully be on time. So there's a story behind the Apple M1, and uh, this is a fact. I do have a relative who works at Apple, and uh, uh, and and a few other folks as well uh, that I know from past lives. Um, and I think it actually goes back even more than five years. But uh, five years ago is when I first found the reference to it. Um, well, the Apple people were, after they switched to the x86, which I'm sure Intel marketing and several uh, lucrative deals caused them to switch from the PowerPC to the x86, they weren't too happy with it. These are software developers, OK? They uh, uh, as one of uh, Intel's large customers, they would get early samples. So they would uh, recompile their code and check it out. And they found lots of bugs with it or issues, whatever. But they weren't too happy. And what upset them even more was they gave feedback to Intel. For whatever reason, Intel chose to ignore it. They never fixed those issues or addressed those or took suggestions for improvement. And uh, I think uh, it, it finally rubbed uh, the Apple people the wrong way. So um, after years and years, they finally said, all right, we're done with you. And uh, they had pretty good experience with ARM because ARM said, OK, here's our risk design. You want to tweak it? Uh, go right ahead. You know your software. And uh, we can uh, do the design, give it to you, have somebody else manufacture for it, whoever it is. You know, uh, you pay for it, you, you can uh, get it. So they went to the ARM people and uh, said, this is what we want. And uh, the result is the Apple M1. And uh, well, it's really an ARM-based uh, chip, uh, very, very similar to the A64 FX that I described, that that design was started six, seven years ago. But it's an entire system on a chip. <clears throat> In other words, on that socket, it's got everything that it needs. It doesn't need any support chips uh, around it. And it is available on the MacBook Air, the Mini, and the Pro. Um, I believe you get 8 and 16 gigabyte versions. I don't know if they have uh, larger. Maybe Jim can answer. Um, uh, my wife uh, has ordered one. Uh, I think she's getting the 16 gigabyte version. What impressed me the most is unlike all the uh, chips I spoke about, which are at 7 nanometers, this is at 5 nanometers. Wow, that is something. That's really hitting the limits of chip fabrication anywhere in the world. It doesn't get any better than that. And uh, there are quite a few transistors to boast about, 16 billion. I mean, the uh, IBM chip is at 7 nanometers. Uh, sure, they have uh, 18 billion transistors, but this is at 5 nanometers, much more dense and close. And look at the clock speed. That's very impressive, 3.2 gigahertz. Well, what they did with their 16 billion transistors, they came up with eight cores, four performance type and four energy types out there. And inside that silicon, they managed to add a GPU, a neural engine for the AI stuff, uh, image processing, as well as uh, IO chips for NVMe and Thunderbolt. And that's uh, quite impressive. This is what the chip looks like. So this is the actual picture of it. 
and uh, somewhere there'll be an Apple number or something on it. And these are all the mounting stuff. And there's your actual chip out there. Uh, quite a bit of uh, real estate with, uh, how many was it? 16 billion transistors. So uh, uh, awfully impressive. And this is what the conceptual uh, thing looks like. On the chip, they've got all their CPU stuff, the cache, the NVMe interconnect, the GPU, the neural engine, and the memory. So this is how very simplistic layout and the pathways between all of this uh, uh, run uh, quite efficiently. And uh, uh, what's more impressive is um, you know, the uh, power that they draw from it. That's very good. So if you look at, uh, again, this is a figure that you can get from the Apple website. But they've compared the performance, let's say at 10 watts, this is the kind of performance you can get out of a, a PC laptop chip. They can easily get twice as much or three times as much from that same comparable. And uh, not only that, they actually have a dynamic binary translator so that you can run your old programs, not all of them, most of them, and it'll uh, run quite fast and uh, won't even draw as much power. So uh, it, it's, it's quite efficient. And I mentioned about that uh, dynamic uh, bit translator that will translate uh, the x86 instruction set to the ARM uh, instruction set. What's funny is that even though it's doing the translation, it actually runs faster than native x86. So uh, that's certainly uh, uh, quite a uh, quite a chuckle. So we're expecting one pretty soon. So as soon as it's here, I'll try it out. And at this point, I wanted to call out to uh, Jim. Jim, you're there, right? Uh, maybe you'd like to share uh, a few thoughts on that. Um, yeah, it, I, I've got the eight gigabyte model. It's just the low end error. I, I just needed. Uh, I, I gave somebody my uh, my old MacBook to do some uh, some iOS development, so I I felt kind of naked without a laptop. <clears throat> so um, I, I just ordered up one. I, I went to Amazon to get it because I could get it the next day, but that's the 8 gig model. The 16 would have taken like a month. Um, uh, it's not my everyday machine. I, I've got a, 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 a iMac Pro as my main desktop machine. This little error is almost twice as fast as my, my iMac Pro uh, for things like compiling uh, projects in Xcode. Uh, I'm not doing big things, but I've got a project that takes about 16 seconds on the on the desktop machine. It takes nine seconds on the on the air. It's pretty impressive. Um, and then you throw in things like the awesome graphics and the battery life is like 18 hours. Um, it's just quite a quite a, a peppy little machine for for uh, you know for the money that you, you pay. I mean, apples are not cheap. But uh, this one seems to be a pretty good value, I think. Um, I, I don't know what else to say about it. Just the thing runs great. Yeah, the performance is pretty good, as well as the battery life. Clearly, uh, they know their people. Uh, once they watch a movie on it, they're watching it or working all day, eight hours. And they don't have to worry about the battery, so they sure, sure. Now the the M1 chip has some limitations. Uh, I think yeah. the limit is 16 gigs of RAM, uh, two USB ports or Thunderbolt ports or whatever they call their ports. Um, so it, it, it's um, you know you get a 16 gig machine and you're kind of hitting the limit with it already. Um, uh, I'm really kind of looking for forward. To when the M4 comes out, you know, that's a couple yeah. of more versions um, when you can get like a 64 gig um, sure. desktop machine. Um, I don't know how many cores it would have, probably a lot. Uh, I, I could imagine it would really, really perform well. Oh, and, yes. I, I have no doubt about that, uh, that it will do pretty good. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, even then, you know, uh, the fact that uh, 
I, I believe the price is not uh, too much than their older x86 machine. You know, it's uh, the difference is not that much. Um, I think the price is the same. I think if yeah, you, yeah. If you bought a uh, if you bought the MacBook Air last year, the the low end is nine ninety nine. If you buy this one, it's nine ninety nine. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, clearly it's a, a, a very good move. Now, you know, there's only uh, one drawback that I have uh, about it was that um, th this chip was designed by them for them, for their customers. I don't expect to see this chip in servers from other vendors. It would have been nice, though. Would have been nice. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. So, and then finally, the last slide, uh, there's basically a feeding frenzy going out there with AI chips or chips specially designed to do AI and machine learning. Now, this is just a single slide, but uh, you've probably heard of the Google TPU, the Tensor Processing Unit. They're already in version three, and I'm sure four, five, and six are uh, in the works uh, uh, out there. Uh, Cerebas is uh, uh, another uh, semiconductor designer, and they get people to fabricate. They're putting, they're creating a very large chip with literally hundreds of cores in it to do all the AI stuff. Intel is uh, uh, coming out with uh, neuromorphic chips for doing special purpose AI. And notice there are two companies out here. Alibaba, a Chinese company, Baidu, another Chinese company, that actually, uh, they're not, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the chip manufacturing business, but they've designed chips for their in-house software, and they're getting people to manufacture it. One of them is called the 800 NPU, the other is called Kunlun, that are designed to do uh, machine learning, search algorithms, uh, pattern, face recognition, all that sort of stuff. I mean, they're getting in the business of AI chips. So what does that tell you? That uh, there's really, you know, a, a mad rush out there of uh, this. And the most recent one, this is like one week uh, news. That's why I put a double ast asterisk after it. Um, uh, there, there's a gentleman by the name of Jim Keller. He's been around quite a long time. And he's well-known chip designer. He's worked for um, AMD. He's worked for Intel. He's worked for ARM, NVIDIA. And he was recently uh, hired by this new company called Tenso Torrent. As you can tell from the name, they want to uh, uh, make uh, AI chips and sell them on the open market to whoever wants them make them in bulk. Uh, uh, they're based out of Toronto, and then they have uh, quite a few people in Austin. So uh, Jim Keller just recently joined them, and this fellow's been around a long time. He's designed many of the chips we've all grown up with and used. So clearly, you know, he sees something in there. So I thought it's worth a mention because once news broke out, he could Intel I think three months ago or something like that, saying uh, personal reasons we didn't understand. But now we know that uh, he was lured away by this new startup. And uh, there probably was a three month cooling period in his contract that you could go to work for a competitor for three months or something uh, when he was hired by Intel uh, a few years ago. So uh, clearly, you know, there's something in there. You probably want to keep an eye on it. And then there's another one that is uh, uh, getting people in Silicon Valley excited. Is this company out of UK called GraphCore, uh, which is uh, creating an AI chip. They call it an IPU or Intelligent Processing Unit. Um, and that has uh, similar to this one, the Cerebas, uh, lots of cores, but it's optimized for doing searching quite efficiently. So, uh, you know, uh, 
and the world is getting flooded with chips. So um, Dave, you're asking how many processor chips are being sold? And while I did answer billions and billions, uh, with all of these AI chips coming out, it's going to certainly uh, uh, add to that and uh, probably make classification of processors uh, a, a real tough job. Yeah. So uh, lots happening out there. So a quick summary, you know, we just talked about the Apple M1. It's clearly right now only on Apple products, but I would like to see it on other boxes, certainly because of the power efficiency and performance. The RISC-V is catching on in the embedded world and growing. And uh, I made a promise to uh, uh, create uh, a slide which shows you all the people selling single, single board computers out there. IBM, despite uh, uh, people predicting the demise of its chip, it's still around and uh, it looks even more uh, fancy and uh, upscale than it did uh, uh, 10 years ago, eight years ago when I last worked with it. Um, ARM, well, uh, they've got an unassailable position in the mobile industry, but now we see they're entering the server world and high performance computing world. And uh, in the AI chip, well, I, I bet if we visit it every six months, there will be new players. Some will be there. Some will be gobbled up. Some will uh, fold up. So it reminds me very much uh, 20, 30 years ago when we had so many other microprocessors out there, National Semiconductor and Motorola's and many others. And uh, many are long gone and uh, new ones have appeared. So. I think the same story will repeat itself when it comes to AI chips. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and uh, yeah, open to uh, take any questions and stuff. Yeah. Uh, feel free to unmute yourselves if you want. Um, also, by the way, we do have the comment card, so please fill that out. I got a question. Yes. Is, is uh, uh, Microsoft is based on Intel chips. Uh, are Intel chips going to die? Are they going to uh, obsolete? Is it time to sell our Intel stock? No, 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 no. Um, I, 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 Richard, I think you're old enough to remember that if you rewound yourself, maybe. 30, 40 years ago, they said the same thing about IBM too, that IBM will uh, uh, wither away and die. I've heard that every decade. They're still around. Uh, I get asked that question uh, every year when I go to supercomputing. And the answer is Intel will still be around because once you build up a large base, um, you know, it, it, they're vested in it. They, they, they can't disappear overnight. It may have happened with others, but I don't see Intel going away anytime soon. Maybe it might shrink a few percentage points, but no, they'll still be around here. And uh, you mentioned Microsoft. Uh, uh, Microsoft is uh, uh, also getting into business of uh, designing chips for its own uh, Azure. There are a number of Azure products. Uh, projects, and they're using something called FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Arrays, but they're using them as assistants, as accelerators or assistants, not the main compute. Uh, their, their latest version of Windows now runs on ARM as well as Intel 86, and I won't be surprised if future versions of their core products, their uh, Cloud products will be uh, done such that it can run on uh, different compute platforms. Um, their current CEO has uh, definitely steered away from putting all their eggs in one basket so that uh, they'll be around for a while. And uh, while they are getting special chips designed for themselves, um, and they do the occasional hardware like the Surface and things like that. 
but uh, they, they'll still be a big uh, consumer of Intel chips. So you don't need to sell your stock. You need to probably buy stock in other companies. But when it comes to AI chips, be a little careful because there's still turbulent times ahead. Is uh, uh, one thing about Microsoft is it's based on Intel instruction sets, all the software that they did people write for Windows 10 runs on that instruction set. So uh, I'm curious if there'll be a point at which they'll start embracing other instruction sets and all the Windows software vendors will have to rewrite their software with other uh, uh, I think I just answered uh, Windows 10 runs on ARM as well, ARM. And NT historically also ran on uh, MIPS and, and uh, yes, Alpha. Yes. Yeah. They do have experience with porting their software to other things, uh, as, as opposed to uh, 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 third-party products that run on them. That's a choice they have to make. But uh, uh, I think they're not, Microsoft is not going to be tied to any one platform. They're probably also going to push into things like translation as well, because the, the Intel x86 instruction set is pretty well known at this point, so they could emulate it pretty efficiently. Yes. yes. Ah, okay. So in other words, uh, a uh, program doesn't have to be recompiled just because the Windows it's running on is running on a on an ARM chip. Well, uh, uh, Apple is very good at that. So the technology is there. Any other questions? Three. If you could uh, build your own data center, maximizing capacity and capabilities and stuff, what would you base it on? Oh, that's a very hard question to answer. Uh, it, it depends upon uh, what kind of software wants to run on my data center. <clears throat> yeah, are you talking about a data center or a supercomputer? All right, they're they're kind of different things. Yeah. Okay. Well, supercomputer then. What would your supercomputer be based on? Well, uh, I I would uh, base mine uh, certainly on the ARM chip. Uh, for one practical reason is uh, out of all the chips out there that they seem to have uh, the best power efficiency, you know? So uh, when, if I were to build a supercomputer to top others, uh, the first thing I won't be worried about, you know, land or area or uh, things I'd be worried about, you know, uh, I can't get enough electricity for it. So I would choose something. Uh, uh, most of the chips out there have exceptional performance. Which one has the least power draw would be a deciding factor. So I would choose the A64FX because it has supercomputer extensions to it. So that would be winner. It has features in it that allow me to add hundreds and thousands of chips together without loss of uh, bandwidth between them. So that would be my choice. Okay, great. Thank you. 